How do you respond to critics who say the carnivore diet lacks essential essential nutrients? Well, I mean, they'd, they'd have to say which ones, and then you could go go through them point by point. But uh, just you know, going back to the sustainability model, the simple fact that there are entire civilizations that do right now practice a carnivore diet and predominant. How do you respond to critics who say the carnivore diet lacks essential essential nutrients? Well, I mean, they'd, they'd have to say which ones, and then you could go go through them point by point. But uh, just you know, going back to the sustainability model, the simple fact that there are entire civilizations that do right now practice a carnivore diet and uh, have no nutritional deficiencies is pretty telling. You know, you can say that, well, the Maasai or the Native Americans or the Native Australians, all these other people that, well, yeah, well, they really ate X, Y, and Z. Well, okay, but um, the there are so many records showing that they're predominantly eating just meat unless they were forced to eat plants or use them medicinally. Um, and just because they may have used certain plants at some times in some areas, North America is a large place. South America is a large place. Australia is a large place. And, and they'll take isolated examples that they have cultivated culture and say, oh, look, I ate all these plants. Like, well, that's those one people right there as an adjunct to everything else they were eating. And it, it wasn't everybody and it wasn't all the time. But you can't really say that about the Inuit. I mean, it's, it's always a good example to go back to the Inuit because like they're up in ice, they're up in the mm -hmm. North Pole. I mean, you have ones that are more Southern and the, and the records from different early settlers from Europe uh, that I've read, even going back to high school, would say that they were just marvel at the fact that they were only eating meat all year round. They said, well, okay, yeah, look in the winter and the deep winter, it was during the mini ice age. So it was, it was very, very cold and snowy most of the year. They said, okay, we'll get it. You know, for, you know, nine months out of the year, it's just packed with ice and snow. So you can't really grow anything, but you know, three months out of the year, you, you could do that. Well, but they don't, they just, they just still rely on meat even in, in those summer months. And they were quite, quite taken aback by that. But then you go up North and, you know, there are no real summer months to speak of. It's mm -hmm. just ice. And so the idea that they that you can't survive on meat or that's not essential for, um, it doesn't have all the essential nutrients, you know, wouldn't work. And all our ancestors that lived through the ice ages would not be able to do that if, if meat lacked any essential nutrients. The Maasai, there was a study from the British in the 1920s, published in 1931, I believe, where they looked at the Maasai and the Akikuyu, who were their neighbors that ate mostly vegetarian diet, and the Maasai were, had a carnivore diet that uh, included milk. And at that point, uh, they started incorporating some like, millet seeds, things like that, but that was not part of their traditional diet. And they were extremely healthy. In fact, they were far more healthy than than their vegetarian Akikuyu neighbors who had a, a more varied diet and all these, these nutritious plants, these nutrients in plants are locked up in ways that aren't bioavailable and we don't have access to largely. And the Maasai, they, they found they were, had none of these nutritional deficiencies that they found in the Akikuyu. The Akikuyu were actually quite deficient in many things that the British tested them for. The Maasai were not at all. So, you know, it, it just doesn't stand up to scrutiny. Uh, mm -hmm. It doesn't stand up to the real world evidence. And we have you know, millions of people around the world now doing a carnivore diet, not taking any supplements, not taking any vitamins, not needing to. And mm -hmm. again, entire populations who have only really eaten this way and not only survived, but thrived. So yeah, it sure. doesn't really, doesn't really stand. <laughs> yeah. Um, people are like, but when I promoted on, I felt in years and mentally. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, you, you know, the, the reason that we, we think we need you know, limes or citrus or vitamin C is because of scurvy. That would be the, the known deficiency for vitamin C, but it's actually not a, a problem. It's not really a vitamin C deficiency. It's a, it's a, it's a, a, a specific amino acid and protein deficiency that makes it so we can't make collagen properly because you have to hydrolyze proline and lysine, which are two amino acids, so that they can go in these, these amino acid chains and then curl up around each other and bind really tightly. If they're not hydrolyzed, they won't bind tightly and bind more loosely. We get loose connective tissue, we get 
low grade, weak collagen and it breaks down, our gums start bleeding, our arteries and vessels start tearing, oh. get you know, our arterial dissections and all these sorts of things. And you, and you die. It's very dangerous. <laughs> But, um, but, uh, oh, but the thing is, is that, you know, if you, you have the hydroproline you know, and lysine are hydrolyzed al already, then you don't need vitamin C to catalyze a reaction that makes those things mm. hydrolyzed. So when you're eating meat that already has collagen in it, you're already getting that proline and lysine pre-hydrolyzed. And so you don't actually need vitamin C to make that from scratch. So it's really just a matter of, of where your food is coming from. So if you're eating meat, you don't actually need vitamin C for that purpose. There are other purposes that vitamin C has in the body, but it's, you know, it's minuscule um, in, the, in the amounts that you need. And so the British, you know, they're called limeys because they, they just, they gave their sailors a whole bunch of lines because they started getting scurvy. Mm-hmm. But they started getting scurvy. It wasn't that that you know they all, everyone was getting scurvy, and the British were the ones that figured it out. We've been seafaring people for thousands of years, and it was only the British in the last few hundred years that started getting scurvy. Hmm. None of the other European powers were getting scurvy, and that's why they called them limey as a pejorative. They were being insulting. They were like, they thought they they were wrong. They thought they were just making this stuff up because none of their sailors were getting scurvy. And in fact, the British sailors were the only ones getting scurvy. The British officers were not getting scurvy because British officers were being fed meat. And the sailors were the ones just getting gruel and, and mm. pork and things like that. Okay. And so they weren't, they weren't getting enough vitamin C. And so then you look at the polar explorers, again, living with the Inuit who aren't getting you know, citrus or anything like that. Mm -hmm. They're just eating meat. The polar explorers that ate like the Inuit did and just ate meat and fish and, and blubber perfectly healthy. I mean, the books written about it, like, like Wilhelmer Stefansson called the fat of the land. They said they've never been healthier in their entire life. And then some people, there are accounts of people in those, in those, um, you know, expo exploration groups who didn't eat that way and were like, sneaking in like sailors biscuits and crackers and bread and things like that. And they were the ones getting extremely sick and nutritionally deficient and almost dying. And then they found their, their stash of food and they threw it out and they just gave them meat and they just recovered right away. So um, vitamin C is not really essential for making collagen as long as you're getting enough meat. And then the other thing you need to, re to realize is that the absorption of, of vitamin C is much, much, much easier when you're not eating carbohydrates. So carbohydrates chemically look like a little fructose molecule with a chain on it. And okay. so it, it actually competes for binding sites with something called the GLUT4 mm -hmm. transporter and the receptor in the, in the gut. And so that gets into the body through GLUT4, mm -hmm. it's utilizing the body through GLUT4, and that's also what takes up carbohydrates. So if you're eating carbohydrates, you're eating hundreds of grams of carbohydrates, but you're getting milligrams of vitamin C, right? So mm -hmm. there's a far, far, far greater amount of, of carbohydrates that you're bringing in than vitamin C. So it sort of offsets it. And so you don't absorb a lot of this stuff and, you know, you're, you're needing it for uh, collagen production when normally you wouldn't. So if you're not eating properly, if you're basically not eating carnivore, a ketogenic carnivore diet, your demand for vitamin C goes way up. 